This is Mr. Harris's fourth and final lecture in the series of four lectures. I won't uh, reintroduce him. I would say that Mr. Harris has uh, appeared in, in so many exhibitions and so many publications on architecture that it would be really impossible to state them all. This final lecture tonight, he's done three previously on his own work, on Louis Sullivan's work, on the Maybeck work, and this final lecture is on the work of Green and Green. Mr. Harris. Thank you. I'm going to give you just a few vital statistics as far as the two greens are concerned. Then we'll look at the slides, and then I'll have a few general things to say, and I hope you have some questions to ask. And if they should be asked while the slides are being shown, please interrupt and ask them then. And uh, we'll try to uh, keep this from being divided into two long sections that may get monotonous. I don't think it will be, but let's uh, not uh, hesitate to ask a question when it seems to be the proper time. Charles Sumner Green and Henry Mother Green were born uh, uh, 15 months apart. Uh, one Charles Green in 1868 and Henry Green in 1870. They were born in Cincinnati, Ohio. They attended high school in St. Louis. It was a polytechnic high school that was under the, the uh, supervision of Washington University there. Uh, realized this was a time when innovations in, in uh, educational philosophy were taking place when technical education uh, was um, in the minds of, of uh, many people uh, who saw in this not merely uh, an education in, in uh, uh, facility with tools, but saw a philosophical uh, aspect of it, too. Anyway, after uh, uh, high school there, they went to MIT for architectural education. And following their graduation from MIT, uh, each, both of them, worked in offices in Boston. Uh, Henry Green for uh, the uh, firm of Shepherd, Rutan, and Coolidge, who were the successors, you remember, to the office of Henry Hobson uh, Richardson. And uh, then they came out to California, to Pasadena, to visit their parents, who had retired there. This was in 1894. And decided to stay, and this is where their practice began and where it ended. Practically all of their work was done here. Uh, they were formed uh, during this period, and uh, uh, so they are a record of, uh, of uh, the time and of the place, and we see their full development uh, in the buildings that were done here. Uh, they practiced until 1914, when the First World War began. It was still in Europe, of course, in that time. It wasn't until the spring of 1917 that the United States went into the war, but, but things began to change immediately here. 
And apparently they realized, whether it was very conscious or not, that this marvelous period and place that they had enjoyed uh, was coming to an end and uh, they weren't able to change uh, and they retired. So they lived on until into the 50s uh, and uh, uh, added things to the earlier buildings, the early houses that had no garages, uh, had garages added to them. I can remember looking at, uh, at uh, working drawings, uh, the sheets added to the early ones. Uh, the garages were called auto barns in those days as they added them. Uh, anyway, let's uh, look at the slides. Uh, ask questions as they go along, and uh, then I'll try to uh, sum up their, the character of their work and its significance at the end. Uh, this is a photograph of the Blacker House, uh, built in 1907 in Pasadena. Uh, it's the largest of their buildings and uh, one of the finest and I'm showing it first uh, because it indicates uh, something of the character of Southern California in 1907. Uh, they were building in uh, a territory that had had little uh, effect made on it by man. Uh, if this slide had been made from a better print, it was made from a, from a uh, tone sepia photograph. It was very, very old. And we don't see in the background, as we should, the line of hills behind Pasadena that uh, was really the background for this. They designed the gardens and the furniture, sometimes the rugs, everything that went in the, and of course the lighting fixtures, everything that went in the house. And this was true of all of their larger houses. Uh, it was total design to a greater degree than I can think of in modern times. And some of the Art Nouveau work, Vandeville in particular, we see uh, an approach to this. But here it became a regular thing with them, and because it was done so successfully, uh, their work is more remarkable than that of others. Uh, this little structure down here, they call the sedalia, I've yet to find a dictionary that has the word in it. The sound of the word seemed to be, uh, make it a good description of this little summer house that appeared in a number of their gardens. Next. <clears throat> uh, this shows the, the uh, entrance uh, to the house here, the porte-cochere over the curving driveway, the use of their most characteristic materials, large timbers, clinker brick, malfoid roof, uh, exposed rafter ends, other things we'll see uh, as we see more of the building. Next, a detail of the support. Next, uh, a view of the garden of the pool that we saw in the earlier photograph, uh, uh, shown closer up. <coughs> Here one sees more of the roof of the building and also the walls. The walls are covered with shakes, stained a dark brown. Next. Uh, this house, like the other large houses, 
uh, had porches. Um, here is a porch that is outside of the dining room. Here is a porch outside a bedroom. Some of the houses had screen porches outside each bedroom. Uh, I can remember when I was quite small that nearly every house in Southern California had a sleeping porch. Usually there wasn't one for each bedroom. Oftentimes in the summer the whole family slept on one porch. Uh, uh, we thought in those days that it was much healthier to sleep uh, in the open air. Uh, there were such things then as fresh air feeds and uh, houses were designed for them. This was also the time when uh, uh, Fletcher uh, said that every bite of food should be chewed 30 times. This was called Fletcherizing. There were many other things of the period that uh, uh, one sees in, in this work. And uh, to properly understand Green and Green and to properly understand Frank Lloyd Wright in his earlier work, one needs to know a great deal more about the times than most of us know. Next. This is a part of the garden. Here is the main house we've been looking at. Uh, uh, there were some uh, smaller structures. Uh, uh, one was a servant's cottage, another a guest cottage, and then in here is a garage. This property was later divided up uh, ten lots, in addition to the lot containing the main house, were made out of it. The garage was turned into a, a, a house. It was painted white. Uh, the furniture uh, which, according to the will of Mrs. Blacker, had to go with the house and everything else because she wanted to keep it one piece, it was very quickly dispersed. It was dumped in second-hand stores and bought as second-hand furniture. A few people realized what was happening and bought these beautiful pieces. But uh, uh, the, uh, the wholeness of it uh, was lost. Next. This is a close-up, and, uh, well, I guess it's just as late. Looks a bit cleaner. Next. Um, this is uh, down that covered walk. Uh, building in a land without any trees, and Southern California was that to start. It took water and some seeds, and that was really all to make trees. Everything grew uh, rapidly. Uh, the growth was rampant uh, over any uh, structure that one might uh, build. You could make artificial trees in a season by simply putting up a framework, an arbor, a pergola, planting a fast-growing vine on it, which would cover it in a month's time. It's true that uh, at the end of the season you'd cut it down to the ground, but as soon as, as the, the weather permitted, it would be up and covering it again. Uh, people rather enjoyed that fact. They didn't insist, as people do now, that a plant be grown when you put it in and that it never grow a bit more so you don't have to cut it, prune it, or do anything about it. It doesn't drop its leaves, so it has to be cleaned up, any of those things. These were not the qualities that were particularly admired in the work at that time. One thing that, I, that uh, is shown very clearly in this photograph, it's worth mentioning, I think, is this feature right here. This is the underfloor ventilation. These houses were not cement slabs on the ground. Uh, they were built on joists. There was a crawl space underneath. It was recognized even in that day that dry rot and termites could attack wood uh, where uh, they were near dampness, where the air was stagnant, and where uh, termites could reach them. So they had generous crawl space under their houses, very seldom much of a furnace, only a pit for uh, a warm air furnace that uh, uh, supplied air by gravity and not by fan. 
Anyway, the fact that you had to ventilate this space, which most architects uh, hate to recognize, do not recognize architecturally, they tried to hide, they, first of all, they make it as small as possible and then try to hide it. And they don't hide it completely, and it's a blemish as far as the architecture is concerned. This is not the way that the Greens went about their work. If it should be ventilated, then it should be ventilated thoroughly, as much as could possibly be required. So they would make their ventilation areas large. They would make architectural features of them. So this is what we see here. In some other view, I hope we'll see their attic ventilation, which was equally generous and equally architectural in its character. Their forms were developed out of their needs and their means, and not out of any plates from a book from their library. Next. More plants. You can see how hospitable to uh, plants the buildings were. The wood was uh, stained, uh, usually either a brown or uh, uh, a brownish green, uh, uh, a bronze green, uh, something that the plants uh, well against and also something that didn't reflect the sun uh, so intensely that the plants in front of it were burned by it. Uh, these russets and tans and bronze greens, of course, were colors that were found both in the plants themselves and in the uh, hills behind, which were green, uh, perhaps uh, during uh, January and February, and by the end of March they were probably already brown, and they would be brown, tawny hills again until December when the first rains came and they could again uh, uh, become green. Next. Uh, this is an interior of the house. We'll see some, uh, those that show more of the space later on. Uh, here we see more details of the woodwork, the finish. Here a lighting fixture, uh, uh, a paneling, uh, which uh, brought out the character of the wood very beautifully. The wood was sanded and rubbed. It was, seven, it was seldom given a piano-like finish. The edges were slightly rounded, enough to make one uh, want to touch them and rub one's fingers lightly along the edges. Uh, um, put in place by usually by small pegs or other uh, means other than nails. No nails uh, ever appeared in the work. No putty is required. Next. This is looking past the uh, spot we are in into the main entrance hall. The doors uh, from the uh, entrance that we saw in the second slide are right back here, and then this one opens out to a garden at the back, uh, a stairway leading to the upper floor. And here we see the large exposed beams, uh, the paneling, uh, which we saw some details earlier, lighting fixtures, and the decoration of the uh, band of, uh, above the door head height between that and the ceiling, which uh, uh, sometimes was in wood paneling and grill work, and sometimes in painted decoration as here. All of this was done by the Greens. Drawings were made of these. It's remarkable how uh, time could be found to do all of this. Uh, we, we found over 500 jobs, working sets of working drawings for over 500 houses that were built during this slightly more than one decade. And all of the larger houses went into as much detail as did the, this house. Next. Detail of the stairway showing 
uh, ends of beams, uh, bracketing, uh, other features that were not to, uh, uh, confined to either one spot in the house or to one house, but that um, were continuous throughout all of the work. Next. Uh, still in the entry hall, but looking from the opposite direction with the paneling visible here. Uh, furniture, all of their design, every bit of this is theirs in the photograph. Uh, I rather like this picture because the photographer tells you something that's happening uh, outside the boundaries of the shot. One knows very well that this is opening out but there is probably a garden terrace out here, the light streaming in from here, and all of the lighting in these early photographs was natural light. The photographer didn't have floodlights. If he were to use anything, it would have to be uh, flash powdered, and he didn't use that. If it were necessary to wait to a different time of the day to photograph this particular room, he waited. If it was necessary to wait to a different season of the year, he waited. They used eight by ten glass slides that had that were very slow. The exposures, uh, those where on the exterior, where shadows are to be found, one notices that the shadows have soft edges. The exposure was so long that the sun had moved a bit during that time. Next. Uh, the upper part of the stairway, the same paneling you see upstairs as down. Next. And more of the upstairs, and I'd like to call your attention to this 1907 storage wall. If we want to talk about simply uh, little uh, innovations like storage walls and 36 inch instead of 30 inch uh, counters in the kitchen, and uh, various uh, domestic uh, utilitarian details like that. We can find plenty of them in the work of Green and Green. Um, but uh, we'll, I'd rather talk about other things this evening. Next. Uh, this is the dining room in the house. Uh, uh, perhaps one could say that this is a flexible room. It's really two rooms. This is the dining room proper here with the dining table, their design, chairs, their design, and their lighting fixture, their design. Looking out through a bank of glazed doors into a dining porch, uh, completely enclosed with more furniture by them uh, for it. Next. Uh, I had these in the wrong order. This is one that we should have seen first, probably, with the doors closed, and then the other one with the doors open. Next, um, a buffet in the dining room. This, their design. Uh, they even went down to San Pedro to the harbor to pick out the logs as they came in, whether it was from Madagascar or, or where the wood might come. They chose the logs before they were ever uh, milled, and uh, 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 ended uh, by uh, supervising the milling and the uh, and the uh, all of the details of construction through a young builder, Peter Hall, who. Uh, gradually came to take over the construction of all of their work, and this enabled them to exercise a great deal more of control over the design than would have been possible otherwise, because Peter Hall learned enough about the work to be able to work with far fewer drawings than would be necessary if this were put out for bids to firms that had never even seen such work before. So there were two advantages here. One, that they had a builder who understood their work 
well enough to be able to work from pure drawings, and secondly, <coughs> that they were two persons, not one, but they worked as one. They had four hands and two heads, and uh, this speeded up the work a bit, too. They worked beautifully as a team. Next. Um, end of the living room in the house. Sofas there designed. Sofas in those days were for people who sat up, not those who slumped or lay down. And uh, in another house that we will be looking at later, it's interesting to look at the early sofa and then at the later sofa that the children a generation later brought in and to realize the difference in the way that people used rooms, used furniture, and generally behaved themselves. Next. Uh, um, kitchen, or rather a serving pantry, butler's pantry, in the blacker house. Uh, this is, is a fact that uh, up until this time, kitchen counters were 30 inches high because kitchen tables were 30 inches high, and they'd worked with tables earlier, and when counters came along, uh, people unthinkingly uh, simply uh, made them table height. It's, it's amazing how long people can, can uh, 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 put up with inconveniences simply because they don't stop to uh, think that a thing can be done any other way than the way they have been doing it. But you notice that uh, whether it's in the living room, the dining room, a bedroom, or a kitchen, the detail is done just as beautifully. <coughs> Next. Now we come to another house. This is probably the second largest, uh, and it is now the best preserved of all of the green and green houses. This house uh, has, within the last few years, become the property jointly of the University of Southern California and the School of Architecture there and the city of Pasadena. And it is being used as um, as uh, uh, space in which uh, um, um, architectural studies are being carried out. But uh, that doesn't mean it's been turned into drafting rooms. It still has a, a highly domestic air about it. It's used for very small conferences and things of this sort. What it really should be is a guest house for the university. Uh, when Henry Luce saw this photograph, he remarked, that's the house in which I spent my first night in the United States. Uh, Henry Luce was the son of a Presbyterian missionary in China, and Luce was I guess he was in his teens, probably, when they came back to the United States. And the Gambles, this is the Gamble House, the Gamble of Procter & Gamble, uh, were strong uh, Presbyterians, as was the town of Pasadena, generally Presbyterian. And, uh, but uh, even uh, Henry Hughes, as, as a young boy, uh, was very strongly impressed by the building and remembered it vividly 50 years later. Um, here we have the same uh, material used for the facing of the walls, uh, a rather large and thin shake, redwood shake, uh, given a bronze stain. This is the original stain on the building, uh, visiting it with Henry Green in 1940. Seven, uh, uh, he went over it uh, very carefully and very lovingly, touching surfaces and and uh, and uh, commenting on it. Um, some of the wood here is mahogany, even in the exterior, in door and window frames. Uh, here again, we see the porch as an important element 
uh, in the plan of the house. In this case, uh, we have an entrance port, which is large and open, uh, covered only by the slight overhang of the second floor. But on the corner here, I'm opening off of a small sediment uh, to this these two windows belong to, is another porch uh, with an extremely interesting um, uh, um, framework uh, supporting a second story uh, porch which opens off one of the bedrooms. There are four uh, principal bedrooms on the second floor, and all four of the <coughs> bedrooms have porches of this sort. They have windows, of course, that are not uh, onto the porch, so the rooms are well lighted, and the porch simply becomes uh, an additional room rather than, than uh, uh, a, dark, uh, a darkening influence from the room behind. Uh, this house has a feature uh, has a material to begin with for the roof that we don't find in the uh, blacker house. You see, I believe there was a portion of a flat, flat roof there, which is like this. This is um, covered not with uh, shakes or shingles, but with composition. The principal composition in use in those days was called Malthoid. It was a trade name. <clears throat> Whereas the, the uh, Greens had uh, recognized more fully than any other uh, designers that I can think of, the, the fact that their materials were of limited dimension, whether it was a shape that had a certain width and length, uh, a rafter uh, that was limited uh, by the length of the timber, if it wasn't limited by some feature of the design. Um, um, rails, which again were limited in length, and if the railing were to be particularly long, it had to be made of a number of pieces. It was this multiplicity of parts that uh, they not only recognized, but they delighted in exploiting in making these then elements uh, in the design that added to the richness, to the regularity, and to the rhythm of the structure. You will notice here how the projecting uh, rafter ends make a dotted line rather than a hard and unbroken line. This, of course, was a uh, not only an interesting feature in the house as one looks only at that, but also an interesting feature as one saw this against the hills uh, covered with rocks and other things that made the lines in nature also broken lines, dotted lines. Next. Uh, this uh, shows a detail what I should have mentioned in looking at the very first photograph of the house, and that is that the driveway, uh, which uh, is a circular one, uh, beginning at one end of the lot, entering at one end and leaving at the other, but something that one can't see as he views the house from the street. The roll in the lawn is very carefully arranged to hide from ordinary eye level the whole of the driveway. So one isn't looking at a broad expanse of paving material. Of course, when it's brick, it's not so unpleasant to look at as it is when it's raw concrete. But uh, even so, it was carefully concealed and, uh, and uh, uh, it was carefully uh, crowned and uh, sloped to take care of the drainage. Next. Next. Uh, this is the same house now looking from the garden side. The garden, by the way, <coughs> uh, slopes down into the Arroyo Seco 
and a few hundred yards this way, up the Arroyo Seco, is the Rose Bowl. Uh, here we see the front porch, we see the porch out from the bedroom on this side. One sees the, the detail of the roof here a bit better than in the earlier picture. One sees how the malfoid uh, material, uh, which is a continuous material, uh, it's unlike uh, the uh, sticks and the boards with which the walls of the house and uh, which the framing of the house is made. Uh, unlike uh, them, the roofing is practically unlimited in length. In actual fact, of course, it's only 100 feet in length in the ordinary roll. But being a continuous material, by nature, it becomes a continuous material in the way it's used in these houses. It comes up one side and over the ridge and down the other, and it doesn't end there. It goes up in another roll and comes around and ends, making an integral gutter. The gutter is not a hung metal gutter here, but it's made by the roof itself. It's by the continuousness of this membrane, so unlike anything else in the house, unless you look to plaster used on the ceilings, now this is a continuous material, a skin, and something to be treated differently from either the bones or the scales that form the rest of the building. Here in the uh, masonry work, uh, below the floor level uh, and forming a base for the building, we see two materials, boulders and clinker brick. Now the boulders came out of the Arroyo Seco below the house. They're large, water-worn, washed down from the mountains above and uh, used, first of all, because they're cheap. They're there, all one has to do is to pick them up and to build them into a wall. Uh, if one were to crush these and uh, mix them with cement and make concrete of them, it would cost more. Cement in those days came by boat and it came from, from uh, Belgium for the most part. Cement was not a cheap material. Uh, it was better to use it as mortar, in the mortar, or with lime mortar, adding cement as might be needed there, and use the boulders. The boulders, however, which were granite, were rather cold. They were in too great contrast to the wood that was used for the building itself, so they looked for something to mix with the boulders. Another very cheap material that was not that was only thrown away at that time were the clinker brick. Those brick in the kilns, and these were beehive kilns and not this continuous uh, sort of thing that we use now for burning brick. But in these other kilns, the brick nearest the fire always was overburned. It actually was glazed in part by the, the intensity of the heat uh, it became practically a lining for the kiln and was thrown away. So the clinker brick, uh, which varied greatly in color and in form, were mixed in with the boulders and used in this particular way. Uh, uh, the boulders, too, became stepping stones. And when Cecil Gamble, the son of the man who built this, decided that uh, it was costing entirely too much money to have the gardener clip by hand the grass around these stepping stones, that he'd rather take the stepping stones out. So they began, and they began digging, and they found that what one sees here is something less than what one sees of an iceberg floating in the water. <laughs> but, but none of these boulders were less than four feet in depth. Uh, this was fortunate for the house because the stepping stones are still there. Next. 
Uh, here we see them again. These are the particular ones that he was going to take out. They lead to the kitchen entrance. But the kitchen entrance deserved just as good stones as the others, and notice how beautifully they are laid. The Japanese couldn't have done better. The Japanese and the Chinese, as I'm sure you've already noticed, have had some influence on the green and green design. Uh, one can probably point to other things too. One can point to the craftsman uh, houses generally in this country and uh, as they came from England and as one can trace them to William Morris and the whole English arts and crafts work. But here we find an oriental uh, influence too. Now this oriental influence is a California oriental influence. In other words, uh, the uh, green and green didn't go to Japan and photograph it. They didn't uh, even probably uh, buy books of photographs of Japanese work. There were very few at that time. Uh, Morse had made a trip back after having served in the uh, um, foreign service there and uh, uh, produced a book with a great many drawings in it of details of Japanese work. But uh, uh, where Green and Green came across the Oriental work was largely in the shops that were to be found uh, in California. Of course, they were to be found in Seattle, too. Uh, in many ways, California, even in 1907, uh, was closer to the Orient than it was to New York City. Uh, this, of course, was true during the, the uh, uh, growth of San Francisco, uh, beginning with the gold rush in 1849, uh, the mountains and the desert and the lack of any uh, transcontinental railway isolated the West Coast from the East Coast far more than it was isolated either from China, Japan, France, or England. Because it was on the water, uh, one could reach other parts of the world much more easily than one could reach other parts of the United States. Anyway, uh, there was a great deal. We not only had uh, the Chinese coolies who had been brought in uh, in shiploads uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s and even earlier. They began uh, really in the, before the gold rush was over. There was the Taiping Rebellion in China. There was the, the, uh, the famine in, uh, forgotten that southern province. It's the one whose cuisine is the Chinese that cooking that we know best here. Well, anyway, uh, uh, rebellion and famine, for one thing, brought in the Chinese, and the Chinese were used uh, principally to uh, grow the vegetables, to cook the meals, to do the laundry, for <coughs> uh, first those who mined the gold and then those who mined the silver. Uh, the rebellion, uh, the, re the revolution in Europe in 1848 sent those independent, democratically minded and stubborn uh, uh, people who refused to stay, brought them to California, which was a land of opportunity at that time. So we had a very adventuresome and uh, otherwise uh, uh, desirable 
uh, uh, class of immigrant. Anyway, people came from all over the world. As a consequence, this was a very uh, cosmopolitan uh, population that we had here. And uh, with the, the uh, downfall of the, of the Manchu dynasty, uh, we had then the loot of palaces pouring into this country, and uh, it filled uh, stores. Few people realized that this was uh, from the treasure houses of the palaces. Uh, it was treated as something quite ordinary, uh, almost as ordinary as what one would buy in a Wilder store now. Uh, anyway, it was through this that the Greens gained their knowledge of the Orient. It was not from any visits there or from uh, uh, books by, uh, by uh, architectural writers or historians. They designed houses for three of the most important importers of Oriental work, three brothers, the Bentz brothers, one had a shop in Pasadena, and they designed a house for the Pasadena banks. This, by the way, is next door to the house that was designed later by Frank Lloyd Wright for uh, Mrs. Millard, Wright's uh, first textile block house, the one he called La Miniatura. Another one was designed in uh, Santa Barbara, for another Bentz brother who was an Oriental importer there. Uh, the third brother was in San Francisco. They did not design for him, so far as I know. Next, <clears throat> this shows the driveway. It doesn't show the effect of that role that I spoke of. These are simply subtleties that uh, are worth noting, I think, because Few things were done haphazardly, and uh, most of them were done so naturally that one doesn't think of them as being uh, uh, carefully thought out. One only thinks of them as happy accidents. Next. Uh, this is a terrace at the back. This terrace uh, connects with the entrance hall, which runs clear through the building. Um, there were two enormous eucalyptus trees here, and the roof on this side has a very large notch in it to allow the trees to go through. The trees are now down. Next. Um, this is the, uh, just inside the main entrance hall. The door is to the right. The light you see here is streaming through the door, and this is the stairway leading to the upper floor. And the general uh, uh, character of the work, that is, uh, the way the uh, wood is shaped and the way it is put together without nails, uh, is similar, of course, to what you saw in the Blacker House just before. Next. Um, still in the stair hall, the stair we were just looking at is here, the railing that you saw is there. This gives us a view of the main entrance door, uh, entrance with side lights, uh, uh, leaded glass and the tree of life. Uh, this is a time, if you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's work, you not only see leaded glass, and geometric rather than in naturalistic forms, but one sees symbolic things, whether it's a tree of life, and one sees a great deal of inscriptions of one kind and another on Wright's work. We don't see inscriptions here, but uh, uh, um, these are ways in which uh, it was thought that a building should incorporate uh, more than the strictly visual. It, uh, literary uh, 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 concerns weren't entirely without the 
bounds of legitimacy and architectural design. Next. Um, the rear part of the hall and uh, more furniture. Next. This is the living room, or part of the living room. It shows the fireplace, an alcove, uh, the, um, what do we call them? Uh, uh, this ingle nook. Uh, uh, the truss exposed uh, over the opening. Rugs that were woven in the Orient to Green and Green's design. Again, the tree of life appearing in it. Uh, and on the extreme right, uh, an upright piano whose case and whose seat, as you notice, are also Green and Green design. And chairs here. Dining chairs, I don't know why these happen to be in here. The photographer must have thought that he needed them for some uh, reason. Uh, but resembling very, very much the chairs that one sees in the uh, houses of rights of the same period. 19, this is actually 1909 when it was finished. The other house was 1907. Remember that Wright's Coonley House uh, that biggest of all of rights and the most complete and to me the most satisfying of all of his houses was 1908. Uh, the chairs, the dining chairs in each are extremely similar in their design and if you think of some of the Art Nouveau work of exactly the same period or if you think of uh, Rene McIntosh's work in Edinburgh of this particular time, these chairs uh, look uh, uh, so natural as to look almost ordinary. It's only the beauty of the detail and of the construction and of the material that really separates them from the work of Wright. Next. A close-up of that Baldwin piano. Next. The detail of the fireplace. It's too bad one doesn't see these in color. Uh, these are uh, mosaic patterns uh, in glazed tile set in copper covering the lintel and uh, carving in wood in various panels used in a rather Japanese form. Next, uh, an alcove in the living room, uh, similar treatment uh, overhead as to that in the fireplace in the ingle nook on the opposite side. As you can see, this is a late photograph. The uh, overstuffed with the uh, with the uh, uh, slip cover uh, does not belong to 1909. Next. The dining room in this house, the same window that we've been seeing in the living room and in other places, the same cut up, the same pattern of muffins in it. And uh, here, the uh, built in buffet, though built in, done with the same materials and the same care as the uh, free were not built-in furniture, such as we see here in the dining table and chairs. The leaded uh, work on the glass above the panel. Next. Next. A close-up of it. Um, next. Uh, this is jumping to another house. This is a house uh, in inland from uh, Santa Barbara in the Ojai Valley. Uh, uh, it's the Pratt House. Pratt was president 
of Standard Oil of New Jersey at this particular time. He had uh, a house on Long Island. It wasn't Delano and Aldrich, but it was an equally fashionable firm of that time. And uh, Henry Green had worked for a short time for the firm when it was designing that particular house. Then, a number of years later, he and his brother were designing a house in California for Pratt. This was a very different house. Uh, the Long Island house belonged to that flowering of eclecticism that uh, one connects with, uh, in his mind, with, uh, with um, um, uh, McKim, Mead, and White. Um, but to here, uh, there was no thought of a McKim, Mead, and White type of a building. This was California. In California, you have a California house. They didn't think of it as being uh, anti-anything, whether it was anti-traditional or anti-anything else. It was just in California you built what was a natural uh, California house. And uh, this was all that one needed to say about it. Modernism was not uh, uh, an issue. Uh, here we see the house against the hills immediately behind it. Uh, one sees again the use of the stone. One sees again the, the dotted line of the eaves. Uh, this uh, textured broken line dotted. Uh, and uh, one thinks of color, of uh, harmonious uh, uh, color harmonious with the hills joining the building to the landscape as well as the plants which were incorporated in the design of the house as a further uh, connection with the landscape. Next. Uh, a view from a lower part of the garden showing the way the boulders were uh, used to uh, help shape the garden. Uh, here we, saw, we find all of the uh, major uh, uh, framing members who are exposed to the elements are covered with copper caps to protect them uh, from uh, the intrusion of moisture which would tend to uh, cause them to split and possibly to rot. Uh, here we have uh, a wood shingle roof, a shaped roof, and here we have a built-in hung gutter rather than the, the uh, integral gutter uh, that was done in, uh, in composition. Next, another view. This is the entrance uh, driveway, which uh, encircled a view late in the afternoon with the sun almost setting, but uh, showing again how in color the house uh, <coughs> blends or almost uh, uh, loses itself in the color of the eucalyptus trees and the other foliage, uh, and how the stones built into the house uh, relate to the stones built into the landscape. Next. Uh, this is the same house, but a much, much earlier photograph before any of the planting had grown up around it. We see here the building in its uh, unclothed state. Uh, no. What's that? No. No, there's a, a, a change in roof level here. Down, down over oh, here. Uh, yes, there does appear to be, and I can't remember what that is. And I've noticed it in the photograph, and I never noticed it in actuality. Uh, this is a, a basement entrance, but why there are two roofs there, I don't know. They appear to be exactly over one another, and I can't imagine what function they serve. But that's certainly true. Uh, notice here 
the ventilation of the underfloor space, as I mentioned before. As we may see in another photograph, but because we may not, I'll mention it here, you will notice that the mud cell, and we always call them mud cells in California, the cell uh, on top of the foundation wall and on which the floor joists rest, because that uh, was a place in which moisture tends to, to accumulate and to remain longer, and where the masonry, which also absorbs moisture, can, can keep the mud sill moist for a longer period, therefore where rot is most apt to start. This particular piece, as Green and Green used it, was completely exposed on the outside uh, and on the bottom as far as possible so that air could get at it, it could be kept dry, rot would be uh, discouraged. It becomes an architectural feature, as you see. Next. Uh, this is a roof deck. Uh, it's covered with, as I recall, although it doesn't appear in the photograph here, with the uh, uh, duck boards, very narrow ones, not more than an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half wide, closely spaced together. Uh, 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 braces on the columns here, where there are glass or open walls. Here it happens to be screened to give horizontal um, resistance. And through it, the hills <coughs> behind. Next. This is a terrace outside the living room. Um, uh, here, and we'll see it better in some other photographs, maybe of another house, the way they often built up their columns out of several pieces, tying them together with iron straps. The iron straps uh, capable of being tightened by simply driving wedges deeper into them. And it was interesting to notice in these houses how these straps and how wood dowels, too, that were used have remained tight for 40 years. Next. Uh, this is the living room looking out onto that terrace that we saw in the previous photograph. Here we see uh, again the characteristic details of the, of the interior finish and of furniture both built in and freestanding. Uh, next. Um, these were redwood panels, I remember. There's a rather high ceiling in this dining room. And uh, the, the redwood is a deep uh, uh, brownish red and still a very velvety surface because it has had nothing, not even wax, put on it. Next. Next. I am not sure about this house. Most of them used hot air. Some of them registers. I remember the house in Santa Barbara for the vents there had registers because they were exposed. Wright, you know, used uh, hot water heating and used registers. This to him was the great, uh, this was the way Wright used uh, so many uh, modern uh, materials and methods to write a steel girder uh, uh, was used according to its nature. Uh, when it permitted him to make long spans and long cantilevers. This was utilizing the tenuity of steel and accomplishing something in a large way architecturally that could not be done otherwise. It didn't consist in using steel as he might a stick of wood, uh, but being careful not to cover it with anything that might conceal the fact that it was steel. 
It was still as a as a, it could perform structurally. That was the important thing to him. And uh, hot water heating was something that enabled Wright to uh, change the house from a small, compact unit, uh, tall if need be, to incorporate the number of square feet required and keep the house from spreading over such a large area that uh, hot air could not travel to all of these rooms by gravity alone. 20 feet, you know, is about as far horizontally as one could move from the furnace with a duct and still provide uh, adequate heating by a convection system of that kind. This was before the days of fans to blow air 100 feet or so if required. But uh, uh, this was the nature of, uh, of, uh, hot, air, of uh, hot water heating and radiators, and it permitted this expansion. Now, in California, heating was not such a problem. A fireplace, uh, perhaps uh, um, a gas heater, uh, although I never saw one in one of these houses, but I've seen them in plenty of others. Only a small amount of heat was usually required to make them comfortable by the standards of those days. And uh, aside from the fireplace, nothing else was ever visible, as far as I can recall, in most of these houses. Uh, here we see uh, uh, another one of those lighting fixtures that uh, we've seen in all of the houses to date. We also see these large uh, beams of, of a single piece of wood, not laminated wood, uh, and resting on a bracket of wood, uh, edges rounded as was characteristic of their work, joined together by metal straps. Here the wood being fir rather than redwood where they were structural members. Next. Uh, this is a house uh, it was a house that uh, was, I think, really remodeled by the Greens. I don't think it was theirs from the very start. However, everything that one can see about it appears to, to, uh, to be green and green. It's, uh, the, uh, the use of, of uh, boulders and clinker brick, this again is right above the Arroyo Seco as are perhaps a dozen green and green houses all very close together. Oftentimes one sees uh, uh, two green and green houses on adjoining pieces of property. It's very much like Oak Park uh, uh, in that section where Wright designed so many houses in the early 1900s that adjoin one another. Next. And uh, here is a snapshot that I made of a hillside uh, simply to show along with the green and green work and show uh, in a little bit better detail uh, the, uh, the pattern that, uh, that uh, stones and vegetation made and which was the background for so much of the green and green work. And if one is looking for uh, 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 a reason or a theory for uh, their use of stone and the dotted line and that sort of thing. Here it is. Next. Uh, and here is more of it. In this case, in uh, Charles Green's own house, which was also uh, along the Arroyo Seco. Here you see large boulders built in with clinker brick. And here we see uh, a narrow wooden gate uh, put together with wooden pegs, but using the glazed Chinese tiles that could be bought in any Chinese store in those days. I had a client who had a few of them, and we used them very, very carefully because they weren't as common uh, 
when I had a chance to use them about well, 15 years ago, as they were earlier. Most of them were a, a, a green glaze. Uh, there were some that were a golden glaze, a rather deep gold glaze. These are the two most common ones, and uh, here they're used very beautifully, I think. Next. Uh, this is a driveway in that uh, house that we looked at uh, just uh, two slides back, the one that I said was remodeled. Uh, here, the, uh, the malfoid roof has an edge that I imagine was not the original one, but it's been done rather skillfully. What's a malfoid roof? What is it? What is it? Uh, it's composition. It's an asphalt roof. But unlike the 15-pound asphalt-saturated felt, which is used in plies, uh, cemented together with hot asphalt, 20 pounds to the square, if you remember your specifications, uh, uh, this is what was called a cap sheet. Uh, usually, uh, only two or three or maybe four plies of 15-pound felt would be mopped on, and then it would be covered with a cap sheet. The cap sheet was usually about 65 pounds per square and uh, uh, could vary in the kind of surfacing it had. It might have a, a, a very fine mineral surfacing or it might have a, a, a textured smooth surface, a surface uh, that one also found on the automobile top coverings of those days. This was before the hard top was made of metal and, uh, and given the same finish as the walls of the body. And uh, one also saw this cap sheet used in cheap construction without any mopped on plies underneath. They were simply put together, lapped, uh, and uh, cemented together with asphalt and oftentimes uh, nailed down with large-headed nails. This was something that could be done by any carpenter without having to, to uh, go through uh, uh, the work that uh, melting uh, uh, asphalt and uh, uh, doing other things that, uh, that a, a roofing contractor is better prepared to do. Uh, this is simply the driveway, shows the, the uh, uh, interesting framework because the framing, as it was exposed, was always interesting. Uh, the roof here uh, have, appears to have been resurfaced and in order to, to get the roll, uh, it's been cut into very narrow strips. Probably it has... Uh, uh, a uh, coating of asphalt and gravel put on top of it. Uh, it may have had a 20-year guarantee, I don't know, but it was probably more than 20 years old when this was done. Next. Uh, a court in the same house. Courtyard. Next. Uh, here we come to another house, uh, another type of house. This is a stucco house. Actually, it's gunite. And the roof uh, is, uh, is uh, a composition roof. Here it is a white asbestos cap sheet that is used. Rolled over the edge to make an integral gullet, a gutter, as in the others that we looked at. Uh, uh, some of their houses had uh, courts that were reached only uh, from the rooms of the house. Uh, this one has a court that becomes an entrance way to the house. Next. Uh, this is the entrance court. Next. Next. Uh, this is another gunite house. Uh, this is a 19... Uh, it's a late one. It was about 1914. And uh, it has a very large garden below. It looks quite a modest house here. 
Um, it's an L, it's a U shape and runs around a huge courtyard and the lower leg of the U is two stories in height with a great recreation room on the lower level opening out into a big garden behind. And the gunite, which is used to uh, form the surface of the walls here, also forms the garden walls, and there must be a thousand feet of garden wall uh, in the garden below. And here, the wall is made by pipes that are uh, set in concrete, isolated concrete fittings, uh, wire mesh, a hog mesh in this case, is stretched between the posts. Then uh, a backing is held on one side of the mesh while uh, the cement is blown from the other side to cover it. And uh, the form of the pipe is kept in the uh, finished form of the wall. A small pattern is used to, uh, to keep, uh, uh, this, this is used in the center of the panels uh, to keep the, uh, the gunite from adhering to the mesh and then removed afterwards, uh, making a cutout that's rather interesting and showing just enough of the mesh to let one know what is happening. The, the roof in this case is glazed uh, tile, a glazed clay tile. It's a dark green with flecks of crimson in it. There's no sheathing under it, or at least not solid sheathing, only uh, spaced sheathing, lath, and it's an interlocking tile and, uh, and is quite waterproof. Next, a close-up of the entrance. Next, uh, the pergola leading down from the house. Uh, um, the wood details you see are similar to what we find in the other houses. Uh, the uh, um, this uh, oriental vine with the purple uh, hanging blossoms can't say its name, you know it as well as I. Uh, it's quite old up here. Uh, the, uh, the court here uh, has a gallery running along this side and around the edge, and then there's a large sunlight at this point. And the glass in this section here, which is quite wide, uh, and in one piece, uh, is counterbalanced and it uh, slides upward into this parapet wall above here. There are skylights or top lighting for clear story openings here and around in the bedrooms at the other end, bringing light into the center of the house. Here, the walk is of cement, but uh, along the edge here, there are tiles that are set in. They're dropped just enough so that the water runs down there and then into another tile or gutter here and off. And this way they keep it from becoming continuous, uh, the, the drainage, and forming in puddles. And it makes a decorative feature, but growing entirely out of their effort to to take care of the drainage problem. Next. Uh, and this is further out in the garden. Shows another little sedalia uh, forming the connection between two different levels of the garden. Remember the gardens were their design just as the furniture was. There was no one there whom, to whom they could entrust the design of either the furniture or the garden, so they did it themselves. It was as simple as that. Next. Uh, this is another house. This was done by Henry Green alone after uh, uh, the office was closed and after uh, Charles Green had moved to Carmel and Henry was left alone in Pasadena. Next, 
another view of the same house. It was designed for a very narrow lot, and it had to be very cramped. And uh, there's some interesting details in it, in the way light was brought into a sunroom, uh, all occasioned by the very narrow lot. Of course, after the house was built, the owner bought the two adjoining lots and had an enormous space then, but it was not available when the house was done. Next. This is the house that uh, is the first of the green and green houses that shows any suggestion of the house to come, the house that we think of as green and green. And uh, uh, the way this happened was that uh, one day uh, after the green and greens had spent several years mixing uh, uh, Georgian and Queen Anne and uh, uh, all the other uh, styles that were floating around the country at that time uh, and producing some rather queer looking uh, shapes sometimes with their efforts to control sun with wide eaves on a Georgian design. But one day uh, into the office came Arturo Bandini. Bandini is mentioned by Dana in his two years before the mast as the most worthless of all of the native Californians uh, that he had ever encountered. They were all a lazy, worthless lot in his opinion. Bandini said that he wanted a California house, and they asked him what he meant by a California house. And he, they discovered that he meant a house that was built around a patio. So this is what they did. But instead of using the adobe that was characteristic of the California house, they used an even cheaper material, one considered the labor involved, uh, and that was simply redwood boards with battens on them. The California house, as it was called, came to be known in those days, had walls that were single boards with battens on both sides. There was no framework. The boards supported the roof. They sometimes supported the second floor. There was usually a girt part way up, usually at the sill uh, of the window. Uh, and uh, this is what they did here. Next. This is looking into the patio. Uh, there were no interior halls in this building, as there were not in the uh, uh, California houses that the uh, native Californians and the Spaniards had used. Uh, they entered the rooms through the courtyard or they went through one room into another railroad flat fashion. Next. Uh, I don't know whether this is Arturo Bandini in the swing or not, in the hammock. Uh, they used uh, the boulders that were there. Here they are sitting Posts sitting on boulders, much the way the Japanese would do it. Anyway, it was out of this crude beginning that these very elegant uh, houses that you saw earlier came. Next. And this is a photograph of the two Greens, a Charles Green and a Henry Green, taken in 1947. Uh, up in Carmel uh, when we were gathering these pictures together. All right, I think that's the last slide. You're probably uh, so worn out with my talk that you don't have any questions to ask. You're eager to go. I could say a lot about them, but probably it's better to stop where I am right now.